Shalom. Shalom, everybody. Thank you for joining us today, this morning. I really hope we are in the BCB. I really hope that you had great high holidays. It's the high holiday season, but now we have some um, just normal time and we can't uh, wait to spend it with you with our virtual Tuesdays, as always. We are back today for the Silk Road, which will have two parts, as it's very long Silk Road. And we are happy to have Jacob Shishan here with us today, as always. Um, Jacob is our beloved uh, tour guide, and he will take us today to the Silk Road. And let's just not wait and hand it to Jacob. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. What an introduction. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let me start uh, the trip. It's going to be a bit of a different uh, trip this time. Uh, because how, how can you squeeze everything, such a large area, such a long history? How can you squeeze everything into these couple meetings that we have? But we'll try. Of course, I don't have to introduce silk. Everybody knows it comes in different forms. There are different textures. There is brocade. There is tapete. There are all kinds of different fabrics. And of course, people will print and dye them in all kinds of wonderful colors and shades. And everything starts with this caterpillar. People by mistake call it a silk worm, but it's not a worm. It's a caterpillar. And right before it changes, they do something which we might not enjoy, <laughs> but it happened by accident. The empress or somebody in China was sitting under their mulberry tree thousands of years ago and something fell into their tea or some other things that they had in the cup which had warm water. And they realized they can use the fabrics. Here is the mulberry tree. You know, these caterpillar only feed on the leaves of this tree. Needless to say, whatever it is that we use today has got nothing to do with what it started with these thousands of years ago. Over the years, it has evolved and changed and they crossed bread and whatever they did to come up with these amazing fibers. But it was not only the work they did on the silk caterpillar, but also the domestication of these incredible animals. It was 6,000 years ago when humans have domesticated the horses, some, some 30, 200 years ago, as we can see, they've domesticated the camels. And another major uh, fact has contributed to our story today. If we see in this satellite picture, we see this kind of bluish uh, color. This is the step which lies between the forested and the uh, taiga, the tundra area in what is today Russia, and the deserts of Central Asia. And that has enabled people to travel without infringing on other people's territories. The steppe have in many parts this kind of vegetation, this kind of grass, which meant they could easily find uh, food for their household animals and for their uh, people to certain extent to use it for fire or whatever. And that is what facilitated the passage through these large areas, thousands and thousands of miles that we call the Silk Road. As a matter of fact, to be honest or to be precise, we should call it the Silk Roads because it was not only one road, it has split and uh, broken into different uh, routes and different paths, whether it was in different historical periods or different geopolitical terms and conditions. In various times, the road went elsewhere. Sometimes it had to do with the presence of a mighty ruler or a hostile civilization. So they've taken different roads. We will stick to the roads that is commonly accepted, the names that are commonly accepted. Basically, we're talking a road that started somehow in Asia Minor, today's Turkey. Sorry, let me get the pointer. Thank you. 
by different routes, it went either by land or by sea all the way to Italy, what is today Italy, uh, and ended up in the far end of China from where it is split into India, into Vietnam, into various parts of uh, Southeast Asia. So this is just a general direction. Here is maybe a better picture so we can relate to the many, many different countries. And we're gonna visit many of them along the road until we'll get today to Kyrgyzstan, this incredible mountain chain, the Tian Shan Mountains. And the next time we meet, God willing, we should all be healthy and travel virtually and hopefully one day travel for real will cover the story in China, which is another incredible story, especially, of course, the Jewish part of it. So we talk about silk, but the truth is that it was not only silk that was traded. Different locations have produced different items, different materials, different tools. They have crafted their art and they have done wonderful things. And here in these deserts, they use the Bactrian camels, as well as the regular camels that we have seen before, and we will see them again. And that's how they traveled forever, bringing those amazing silk items, but again, not only silk, into the many, many different marketplaces, the stores, the shops, in various locations. So what was traded was, of course, the silk, but also we see glass, animals, carpets, all kinds of amazing thing. And when you look at the list, the list is amazing. They have used this route, the Silk Road, to connect east and west, not only for human uh, travel, but also commercial travel, introducing developments and inventions and discoveries from one part of the world, the ancient known world at that time, they, nobody knew about the Americas and Africa was terra incognita to most people, impassable almost. So this is such an important story to think that that is how things have traveled across. The important story was immortalized in many different books and movies and compositions, so one can learn a lot about it. We'll visit briefly a few of the countries it crosses. Uh, this is no way, by no way, in no way, this is gonna be a discovery of Turkey. We'll just highlight some items there, but I like always in each and every country, we'll give the figures of the Jews still living in this country. Of course, Turkey has seen the presence of tens of thousands, subsequently hundreds of thousands of Jews, especially after the influx from Spain, 1492, the edict of expulsion made at least 250,000 Jews, half the Jewish population of Spain at the time live, and many of them found shelter and refuge in the realm of the Turkish Empire. At that time, it was not Turkey, it was the Ottoman Empire with Istanbul as its capital. The beautiful shrines and sanctuaries, some of them were built as mosques, some of them were built as churches during the Byzantine era, which ended up in the 16th century, subsequently converted into mosques. Uh, Istanbul raises both arms of the Bosphorus and the Golden Horn. And as we travel through the city, eventually, sooner or later, we're going to come into the Grand Bazaar, Kapali Charshi, which is really an amazing myriad, a maze of small streets and narrow lanes and wider walkways with dozens and hundreds of shops carrying any item under the sun, especially the more colorful, the better it is. And it is the place for us to come and look at the glassware and the pewter and the ceramic and the carpets and whatever. Next door, we will proceed to visit the famous imperial palace, the Top Kapı Palace, right on the shores of the Bosphorus waterway. Entering inside is really legendary. We go into a different realm 
with the marble and the granite and the beautiful decorations in metal and ceramic tiles with inscriptions with the rugs and the china and porcelain and all kinds of stone carving, the beautiful crystal chandeliers. And um, somebody can really get lost, I personally do, for long minutes or even more than minutes, just admiring the wrought iron, the wrought brass and copper, the carving in the uh, marble and the different colorful stones inserted into the stone, the marble pieces. Of course, one should also visit the modern after centuries of using the top Cape Palace right on the shores, this time at literally the water level, Dolma Bahce. This is late 19th century, early 20th century, still very ornate, beautifully decorated kind of a palace. And definitely it should be a must on your list when you visit this beautiful, glorious city. The interiors are amazing. And it was home, as we mentioned, to a very large Jewish community, still is. The largest Jewish community today still lives in Istanbul with another uh, fairly large size community in Izmir and uh, dozens of smaller communities throughout this huge country. With still many synagogues functioning where they keep and maintain very unusual for most of us rites and rituals in the synagogues in the best tradition of the Sephardi Jews. Most of what they do today was brought over and carried forward when they left Spain in the late 15th century, early 16th century with the special outfits, with the special tunes and hymns and magnificent liturgy which is still being practiced in these many different synagogues all over this country. As we have done, those of you who have been with us before, I'd like to pay tribute to the righteous among the nations from that country. In this particular case, I'd like to pay tribute to Selahaddin Ulkumen. He was the Turkish consul in the Greek island of Rhodes. Rhodes was ruled by the Italians until the Germans changed their taste when Italy ceased being an ally along the axis, the power of evil uniting Germany and Italy, subsequently Japan at a later phase. So when the Germans arrived, they wanted to deport all the Jews. These gentlemen claimed that a few people were subjects of Turkey. Couldn't really prove it in too many documents, just some registration. And then he said, this couple dozen people qualify to bring with them also the relatives. So he managed to save many people who moved from Rhodes to Turkey and that's how they were saved. I mentioned the Ladino language. It's a fascinating language. Actually, it is a a uh, Jewish dialect of 15th century Spanish, uh, written in both Hebrew and in Latin character, using letters that are not used today in the Spanish language and the grammatical form has changed. So for centuries now, great Spanish scholars have been studying Ladino, which is still being spoken by few people though, but until a few decades ago, many people spoke this language and they came to investigate and learn about their own language, the way it was spoken centuries ago. The presence of Jews in Turkey goes way back. One of the oldest known synagogues and a huge synagogue is located in Sardis in the region of Lydia in Turkey. And this synagogue is absolutely magnificent with the marble carving, with beautiful mosaic floors with architectonic elements. Something that is typical of Turkey to begin with, you know, when we talk about Turkey, Asia Minor to be precise at that time, you are gonna find out that great parts of what you know about Greece are actually located in Turkey today, whether it's the beautiful library of Ephesus 
which is a remarkable masterpiece of architecture. And you're going thousands of years back. You're going more than 2000 years ago with beautiful sculptures and statues and carving and decoration. Even the story of Troy, everybody knows the Trojan horse, the Troy story actually takes place in Turkey. That's where Troy is located. This is where Schliemann has found this wonderful, wonderful jewelry, which is believed to be the jewelry of Helen, beautiful Helen of Troy. And at one point he let his wife wear this jewelry. At that time, there were no color pictures. So you can see how beautifully decorated his wife looks with the jewelry that is thousands of years of age that probably, who knows, belonged to Helen of Troy. But other than the Greek and Roman civilization, other than the Muslim civilization, we go way back. Look at where we go. We go some 8,000 years ago, almost 8,000 years ago. We're in the center of the plateau, the Anatolian plateau, lies Hattusha. That was the capital of the mighty Hittite empire that has left some most remarkable items, but something that is even older and that knocks everybody socks off. Nobody can explain it. No matter how long we have been studying it and comparing it, we couldn't find a way to explain how come there has been this ancient civilization. Look at it, Gebekli Tepe. This is nearly 12,000 years ago. And they were able to use material, God knows what material. This is long before there was metal of any form used for carving and they created this amazing carving in the stone and chiseled and made the surface of the stone. This is something that we admire and cannot get over it. Turkey has also some amazing natural phenomena with hot springs with the huge deposit of calcium creating these amazing pools. It is called in Turkish Pamukkale, which means the castle of the cotton. One of the most incredible areas to visit in Turkey is the Cappadocia region, where lots of people now, at least until Corona, I hope it will resume soon, have been enjoying the site which is best viewed and an incredible perspective is given when you do it from the hot air balloons. These are some relics left over from ancient rocks which mankind has been using for dwelling. At one time in bigger areas, they have carved and chiseled inside some churches and monasteries. And here you come for the most incredible fifth, sixth and 11th centuries uh, Christian Byzantine iconography, which is like nowhere else in the world, really, really special. We go a bit further to the east on this amazing country. We go up to the northern mountains and we visit Mount Nemrut with these fascinating images of the king. And next we see an incredible mountain. It is in Turkey, but it is worshipped by a non-Turkish civilization we're going to visit. This is Mount Ararat. They believe this is the mountain mentioned in the scriptures as the place where Noah Ark has landed after the flood. It is right on the border between Turkey and Georgia, which is the next country, and, uh, and Armenia, which is the neighboring country. And Armenians believe that this mountain is part of their civilization. That's their holiest place for them in Armenia. Actually, Armenia today is a tiny little country, as you see, squeezed between Azerbaijan and uh, Turkey and, um, and um, Georgia, which is nearby and so on. But at one time, 2000 years ago, it was a huge empire. Imagine in the first century, before the common era, they even ruled over my country, over what is today Israel, Jerusalem, and even Gaza was part of the huge Armenian empire. Today, it's a tiny little country, less than half the size of Israel, with a third of the population of Israel for that comparison, 
with a very small Jewish population. The country is small and the border goes right next to Mount Ararat. So it's something for them to look at for many centuries. They couldn't uh, get a hold of it after they stopped being a mighty empire, but they still dream about it. Not far from their capital in Yerevan is the Etchmiazin Cathedral, which is considered to be the oldest cathedral in the world, and that's the holiest uh, shrine for them, the holiest place within Armenia itself. Uh, we see a procession, unfortunately, most of their processions today have to do with commemorating the first genocide of the 20th century, where about a million and a half Armenians, along with other, there were Yazidis, there were Assyrians, there were other minorities, were brutally, brutally murdered by the Turks, something the Turks do not allow us to say. There is a law in Turkey against anybody who claims that the Turks have killed all these people. But what can you do? You know, when the Nazis first introduced their ideas about eliminating the Jews of Europe, Hitler himself asked, what will the world say? And the answer was, did anybody say anything about the Armenian genocide, which took place 20 years prior to those events? So there you go. This map shows us the extent of the massacres, the locations where Armenian, Armenian genocide took place. Some people tend to use the word Holocaust. We'd like to reserve <laughs> the, 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 the use of the word Holocaust for what happened to the Jews, but no question it was a major catastrophe that took place all over this country. Today, there is only one functioning synagogue in Armenia. It's a small population. and Most of them do not live there permanently. They come and go, as is the case with many of the neighboring countries. For example, we go now to Georgia. And look, we cannot even estimate how many Jews are there. You're going to get conflicting figures because many of them have dual and triple citizenship. They are citizens of Georgia. They go back and forth to Russia. They come back and forth to Israel. And that's why we cannot give a precise figure. So we are still in the Caucasus Mountains. We moved over to this uh, corner. And we see on the shores of the Black Sea, we see this amazing country, which is a beautiful country, bordering in the north and occupying big chunks of the high Caucasus mountains, and Russia is right across the border from them. Uh, this is the site of many different ancient legends, even part of the Greek mythology, which talks about the Golden Fleece. You are familiar with the story of the Golden Fleece. This is where it took place, right here, in this area, in the territory called Chalkis, which is today part of uh, Georgia. You know, the Golden Fleece plays such an important role for the longest time. The Golden Fleece was dangling and pending from the emblem of the Spanish royalty, imagine, on the far side of the European continent. But it's such an important part of the story. And this is probably where they attribute the story supposedly to have taken place. The capital of Georgia, Tbilisi, is a most beautiful city very colorful, featuring ancient ruins and fortifications, as well as some modern architecture and modern churches. It's a Christian country. I personally love the bridge and I love the music center. The patron saint of the country is St. George. This gilded statue of St. George slaying the dragon lies in the main square of town. And when you leave town, you go to the outskirts, you find some magnificent countryside, and every hilltop is dotted with some most typical architecture of their local churches. We have quite a few synagogues in the country, not only in Tbilisi, but in um, other uh, towns and communities as well. They still publish their own Jewish newspaper, which is printed in the Georgian language, every now and then they will have an issue published in English, in Russian, and in Hebrew as well. So 
We have been to Turkey, Armenia, Georgia, and we continue and we move over. And the next place for us to describe will be, we mentioned the Caucasus Mountains. And here we can visit quite a few places. Some of them you might have heard uh, in the news, not always in a positive way, whether it's uh, Chechnya or what happens between Azerbaijan and Armenia, which is very, very sad. So Azerbaijan is a little larger country, same size population, a little larger population than Israel. And again, we are not certain how can we relate to amount of the Jews who are there. Here we cross the Caucasus mountain from the shores of the Black Sea to the shores of the Caspian Sea. Oil and gas rich Caspian Sea. Israel today gets most, most of our oil through amazing uh, schemes and ways and arrangements from this land, kind of landlocked uh, sea, the Caspian Sea by way of Azerbaijan and the pipes that go through the neighboring countries and bring the oil through the Mediterranean to Israel. I'd like to draw your attention to this town, which is Cuba, Guba. Even though the capital is Baku, and here in this area, that's where we have these oil rich fields. The country is very rich in natural resources. We said oil, we said gas, and the modern architecture is stunning. The skyline is dominated by these amazing three towers because of the story of the fire that was burning because of the gas that they were able to use for a millennia. So these are the flame towers, which are beautifully illuminated at night as well as being so gorgeous at daytime. Zaha Hadid, the late architect, has built a beautiful cultural center in this town, the Haider Aliyev Cultural Center. It's a unique building without a single straight wall inside. It's a landmark and highly, highly praised architectonic treasure. The synagogues we have in the town in Baku, we have a couple of them. We have here a very interesting story. Um, as you can see some 29 years ago, a major, major struggles took place between the Azeris and the neighboring Armenians. That was after the collapse of the Soviet Union, which has included all of these countries we're visiting today. Uh, but as soon as the Soviet Union collapsed, everybody was trying to carve a bit for themselves, but it was very confusing because of the ethnic minorities and the ethnic structure of the population. So a major battle took place, and one of the heroes of this battle is this Albert Aronov. And here you see a memorial to him right in the center of the city. He is highly, highly I would even say venerated, not just respected and remembered by the Azeri people, a major feature, an amazing Jewish structure in the middle of town. I mentioned the town of Cuba in the northern part of the country because I'd like to take you now through this amazing countryside of these Caucasus mountains where we're gonna visit the mountain Jews. They are located here in the small villages around the town of Cuba. And what happens, they create Jewish towns, Jewish communities, entirely Jewish communities. Other than Monsi, New York, I cannot think of another place where you can say outside of Israel, the whole town is Jewish. And here is one of them with their beautiful synagogue, really, really nice, beautifully kept, and beautifully decorated with the local art of creating the rugs and carpets. And you can see they have a mikvah and the Jewish cemetery, which is quite interesting. I mean, you go to the end of the world. I mean, who's ever thought in the center in between those high ranges of the Caucasus mountains, you see the Jewish cemeteries. The cemeteries are constructed over the last few decades in the best tradition of what Russian cemeteries would look like with the names inscribed in the Cyrillic language uh, characters. But look what they do. They engrave laser guided sand blasting over the granite. They engrave the pictures of the deceased. 
written, the names are written as you see in the Russian, in the Cyrillic language uh, character, as well as in Hebrew with the Star of David everywhere. In your country, you can see it if you go to cemeteries where there is a large Bukhara, Tashkent, Samarkand, Uzbek Jews, they still do it or Georgian Jews. So you can see it also in your country, but in most Jewish cemeteries, of course, you won't have these images of the people graven on these tombstones. So it's quite unusual to see this kind of Jewish tombs and cemeteries. We move on to another country, Turkmenistan, very large area, very small population, very small Jewish population. This country, which lies here on the other side of the Caspian Sea, on the eastern shores of the Caspian Sea, has more gas reserves than Mexico and a few more countries put together. It's unbelievable how much there is, needless to say, as the case is in many other places, the country is very poor. Part of the poverty derives from the fact that for a long time they were ruled by a lunatic, somebody who saw filled and full of himself, he has created an unbelievable city, more marble here than in any other city in the world, more gold is used outdoors than any place else you can imagine. And this is the gentleman, Niazov. He's erected his statues all over the country. He has named everything after himself. He made himself the father of the Turkmen nation. He changed the names of the days of the week to the names of his relatives. I mean, he did something unbelievable. And again, when he was asked by foreign uh, journalists about his statues all over the place, he says, oh, I didn't want my statues everywhere. Uh, it was uh, demanded, it was asked by the people. The people wanted me to put my statues in all of these places. So you have some unbelievable monuments with the gorgeous fine quality marble and gold. There is this alibi dog, which is an indigenous endemic dog and they celebrate the dog holiday, their national dog holiday. Look at the telephone booth. Look at the bus stations, bus stops. I mean, you can wait forever for the bus, which doesn't come too often, but look how gorgeous they made the stations or this shopping mall, which is so beautiful, needless to say, the shops are empty, nothing to buy. I mentioned fire. Decades ago, all of a sudden, there was a spontaneous inflammation. All of a sudden, there was some fire coming out from a sinkhole. Maybe it was a thunder or a lightning or something that has caused it. They thought it will be put off, it didn't. They tried to blast it with explosive, they only made it larger. And today, this is an incredible tourist attraction, the fire that keeps on burning and has been burning for decades. It's a tourist attraction. Uh, it's a Muslim country, if we didn't notice it by now by the architecture. So also beautiful new mosques were built all over the place. And the Jewish story has to do with a very, very unusual event that took place during the years of the Holocaust. Here are hundreds of Jewish kids, teenagers and younger, who were either orphans or somehow separated from their families, who went on an incredible trip. They mostly came from Poland. When Russia took over the eastern part of Poland, many of them with their families or on their own with other relatives, fled and went into the far edges of Siberia and then made their way through Central Europe, sorry, Central Asia, of course, by way of Uzbekistan to Turkmenistan on their way to Persia, to Tehran, and then they went to Karachi, Pakistan, and then by boat, they went around the Red Sea all the way to Egypt, where they took the train to come to Israel, the trip that lasted almost two years. You have to read about them in an unbelievable story, the Tehran children. I mentioned the fact that they went by way of Persia. Persia, as well as any other country, really merits a whole 
visit for with us, but we'll do it very briefly. So you see, between the Persian Gulf and the Caspian Sea, that's where Iran gets not only some of the gas, but mostly the caviar. They are still a very large producer of caviar that comes from the fish that manage somehow to survive in the overpolluted Caspian Sea. Uh, huge country, huge population, and still many Jews. Also here, we talk about Jews, don't tell it to anybody who could leave Persia if they wanted to, they could leave Iran for whatever reason they prefer to stay. Whether they travel outside or not, we will not disclose, but they are quite comfortable. Most of them live in the big towns like Tehran, Shiraz, Isfahan, Tabriz, and so on. Tehran has the largest community. Tehran is a beautiful city right at the foothill of the snow-capped mountains. And we have here some Jewish sites, or at least traditionally Jewish sites, namely and mainly the tomb of Esther and Mordechai from our Purim holiday. So this place, everybody recognizes they were Jews. The inscription is in Hebrew and uh, the Hebrew characters, but it is worshiped by millions of Persian Muslims who come to venerate at the tomb of Esther and Mordechai. And of course, the inscription also on the tombstone is in the Hebrew language. This country, and I hope one day when things will change, hopefully soon, we should be able to visit because visiting it is an incredible experience into the world of art and decoration between the ceramic tiles. Look at the gorgeous ceramic tiles, the symmetry of the Muslim and even the pre-Muslim architecture, the stone carving, the beautiful antiquities, magnificent palaces and palatial mansions with the stained glass windows and the ceilings and the domes. The beautiful gardens of Isfahan. Isfahan puts to shame as far as I'm concerned, any city when it comes to these rich decorations in ceramic tiles. I mean, where else could you see? Sorry if I get a little personally excited because I really love this place. And look at how gorgeous it is how beautiful they have created it. We'll continue to the next country, Uzbekistan. Most of the Jews who lived there left in the last few decades, some of them moved to Russia, some of them to Western Europe, the United States, but most of them came to Israel. So in Uzbekistan, which is, as you see, next door as we move on after Turkmenistan, we talk about a few centers. We talk about uh, Samarkand, we talk about Tashkent, and we talk about Bukhara. So these are the three major Jewish communities, even though there were Jews and still are Jews living in other parts of the country. Again, a Muslim country with beautiful Muslim architecture, with rich tradition, like Nasreddin Hoja, the famous folk character who has like, he's like a street smart and he comes out with all kinds of creative, innovative ideas. The architecture of the towns is, is demonstrated in the construction of the madrasa. Madrasa in the Arabic language is a school. In this context is a theological seminars like Midrash, right? We have in Hebrew, Beta Midrash, Madrasa. You know, there is no hierarchy in Muslim religion. You don't have like a bishop or archbishop or a cardinal. So people will study and all of them will be the same when it comes to their practice. But they study the four different schools, the different philosophies of Islam, all in each and every of these madrasas. Again, magnificent treasure of art and decoration in this beautiful, beautiful ceramic tiles which are dotted all over the country. So Uzbekistan has given a birth to lots of the uh, art that is to do with carpets. Many of the carpets, many of us know as Persian rugs, actually are produced in the neighboring countries. Azerbaijan does even nicer than the Persians and Uzbekistan has their share and lots of the items are displayed, prominently displayed 
in the marketplaces, in the bazaars of the various towns. Next, you go to visit the marketplaces, the food market, which is quite different from most other places. And the synagogues here are very different. What makes them different is the way they practice. Look at it. They don't sit in pews. They sit on chairs and in front of all of the prayers, the praying people, there is like a desk. So they put their siddurs, they put their prayer books and whatever on the desk. So we have quite a lot of these synagogues, but something which is very interesting is the coexistence. Jews have felt comfortable. Most of the years still are very comfortable and very much protected among and against the backdrop of these Muslim presence, the beautiful Muslim architecture. The country is a Muslim country by definition, but they're not necessarily too strict. There is no radical Islam in most of the cases other than the beauty of their shrines and sanctuaries. Look at these beautiful ceilings. And of course, in the marketplaces, remember we're still along the Silk Road, so I didn't mention Silk for a while, but it's located everywhere. And more than in many other places in the beautiful shops of the marketplaces in this country, in Uzbekistan. Look at the fabric, the rolls of fabric and the merchants selling all kinds of food, wearing their traditional outfit, they grow the most incredible fresh produce. Nothing is frozen or nothing has to travel too far. It's farm to table. They specialize in their unique kind of bread. And let me warn you, if you take a bite, you cannot stop it before you'll finish the whole loaf. While waiting for customers, many of the merchants will stuff the dates with some nuts. They'll use pecan or walnuts into the dates. Next door, we will see some incredibly decorated ceramic tiles and plates, and people decorated their houses as well. Uh, this is our friend Nina. She's a music teacher. She immigrated to Israel, worked here for many years, went back where she has a guest house in the town in Samarkand. She goes back and forth. But in one of the former dwelling places of a very wealthy Jewish merchant, they turned it into a museum. I mean, can you imagine? This is a private person house, so richly decorated. And today it houses the National Museum, where we go to discover about the rites and traditions and the outfits, the celebrations. Quite interesting. Also in Samarkand, as in the other towns here, we have this feature of the kind of desks in front of the people sitting in the synagogue praying, of course, richly decorated, beautiful uh, light fixtures, beautiful ceilings and decorations on the walls. Quite a lot of synagogues, not only are there, but still functioning synagogues, active and functioning synagogues. But when we come to this region, we stop talking for a minute about the traditional local population or Jewish population that has been here for a good 2000, maybe 2500 years. Look at the people in the picture. Obviously, they are not the local Uzbek Bukhara Jews. These are Ashkenazi Jews, mostly from Poland. They were taken away by the Russians to work as I would say almost slave labor, but I don't care because, I mean, I heard, but the fact is that they survived, many of them. A quarter million Polish Jews survived in this region from Siberia. They were brought back to these mountains where they worked in the weapon and ammunition industry. And it's a fascinating story by itself. You might have met somebody who told you that themselves or their relatives have survived in uh, Central Asia. So this is the place where most of them ended up. Even in the cemeteries, next to the traditional tombstones of the local Jewish community, which look like the, their neighbors, but here we'll see also some Ashkenazi names. You see here two girls, twin girls, Yuta and Roize, daughters of Josef Rechler from Moscow, 
They were one month old when they died. And here is another child, Moshe, and so on and so on. So next to the traditional tombs and the Ashkenazi tombstones, we have the ones that belong to the period when the Soviets were here, especially after the war. Uh, they started using this uh, type with the menorah, with the Star of David, what with the images of the deceased buried. One very unusual tomb is here. This is the tomb of our prophet Ezekiel. They have a tradition that after he died, his body continued growing. So they built a very long mausoleum and look at the length of the tombstone because they really believe that if we would ever open it, we will find a huge skeleton of prophet Ezekiel buried in this tomb. We move over to Tashkent, the capital. And other than being a modern city with fascinating architecture, what I love most, not only the modern and the Muslim architecture, what I love most about the city is their subway stations. I've never seen anything like it. I thought I saw beautiful stuff. You might have seen the ones in Moscow, St. Petersburg. But here, look, look at the subway station, so richly decorated, so ornate, with beautiful light fixtures with beautiful glass decoration and ceramic tiles. This is the synagogue of Tashkent in a picture from uh, many years ago. And this is the way it looks today. And we move to the next town, Tajikistan. Actually, it's basically the same population should be as Samarkand. They speak a different language in Samarkand than in Tashkent and Bukhara. The official language of Uzbekistan is a Turkic language, whereas in Samarkand and Tajikistan, they speak a language which is closer to Persian. Very small Jewish population in this town, but worthwhile mentioning it. And if you visit it, you would love the views. You will enjoy looking at the modern architecture, but you will here be reminded of a very special person that has written in the Persian language some of the most important epic novels and literary creations for the entire Muslim world. And this is Nizami. He is highly respected. The tomb is a major, major, beautiful location. His uh, stories were, ad were um, decorated in beautiful, um, what do you call it, um, paintings and description, whether it is a description of the story of Muhammad riding his winged whatever animal, like winged horse coming to visit Jerusalem on the night trip, or uh, Laila, the love of Laila, where this gentleman who made so madly in love with a lady he couldn't marry, starved to death in the desert, and all kinds of beautiful stories that one tells here. Still a functioning synagogue, even though a very small Jewish population, and not only in this town, in Dushanbe, but also in Khujand, in the cemetery of Khujand. And what I like about this place, look, even these miserable housing projects, the public housing buildings were very nicely decorated. They should be a little more pleasant to look at. We move over from Uzbekistan to the next country, which is Kyrgyzstan. Now, I love this place. A uh, much larger country and a smaller population. And again, who knows what's the number of the Jews? What's interesting to notice is their flag. The flag looks like a sun with 42 rays and some interesting structure. We'll find out about it later. The rays denote the regions of the country that was conquered by their legendary hero, Manas. He is the traditional founder of the nation, the father of the nation, who conquered these regions and brought them under his rule. And again, a Muslim country with beautiful Muslim architecture, but the tomb of Manas reminds us of this person. Who is this person? There are many of them all over the country. He is a storyteller. Manas has written the epos, the epic composition, which is the longest in the world, twice as long as the Iliads on Odyssey. 
by Homer. Imagine. And it was not written down. It was carried forward for centuries from father to son, from teacher to student, from one storyteller to another, until it was published only in the 19th century for the first time. So these like troubadours traveling around the country tell the story and that's how they make a living by telling the beautiful epos of Manas. The capital Bishkek is a modern town. Again, we are approaching the, this time we left the Caucasus of course, now we're approaching the Tian Shan mountains and uh, don't spend too long in town, see the important sites, come and visit the synagogue, and then see the tomb of the unknown soldier. Even because they are so God forsaken, they still have statues of Lenin, which in most other places were pulled down after the Soviets left. And here, 30 odd years later, they still have Lenin prominently displayed in the squares. Here also, I love the marketplace, the traditional dresses of the vendors, a little different than the others. Another legendary hero, but I like to take you to the countryside because that's really why people should travel. Magnificent countryside dotted with these kind of tents. They are called yurts. That's how people in this region in neighboring Kazakhstan, which we didn't go to visit today, and some of the other neighboring uh, territories, that's how, and of course, across the border in China, that's how many of these nomadic tribes live. These yurts are very, very unique and typical of this area, which makes it interesting is the fact that they can be easily taken apart and rebuilt in no time so they can move across this terrain, following their sheep and goats, bringing them to the water places, to the rivers and lakes, and especially that's where they breed and cultivate their horses. Many of these nomadic tribes still hunt with these uh, birds of prey, and this is how they build the yurt. It used to be built out of some wooden pieces, but now you see they use modern materials, very lightweight plastic, it takes them half an hour to take it apart and 40 minutes to rebuild it elsewhere. Many of them live in these very humble, very simple conditions. Many of them, of course, are very, very poor, but look at the addition, a solar panel that was added on the skin um, kind of covers to the roof. But now that we visit that place and we'd like to experience it, they are providing us with magnificent glamping. We can stay in these beautiful yurts. They made them to be very comfortable offering all modern amenities, serving their wonderful food, where we can enjoy their art, their beautiful embroidery and weaving, hanging on the walls of the yurt. Here you can see those uh, pipes that I mentioned that are made out of plastic, but they're very, very sturdy. The way they built it, it will resist the weather even in some tough storms and strong winds, which uh, create these steps, these uh, uh, kind of um, um, meadows, if you wish, uh, in these valleys in between the Tian Shan mountains. That's, as I mentioned, where they graze their horses, their sheep and goats. And it is important to mention that here we come to a major caravansarai. This was a trade station from the 12th century, denoting the fact that this was an important branch of the Silk Road that took them across these mountains into China back and forth. It's interesting to visit in this region to visit their cemeteries, very unusual tombstones, very unusual mausoleums that uh, uh, attract the nomads to come and bury the dead. Sometimes they will travel for days to come to the cemeteries. And that's where they will meet the other people, whether it's on the shores of the lake or in this uh, places that ended up being like marketplaces. The modern uh, stations, if you wish, along the Silk Road do not go all the way from China, but locally. And that's where they will come and trade and sell and buy their household animals. 
that's where they'll train the kids to ride the horses. And you can see them wearing many of them, not because only for the picture, but during the races and festivities and gathering, they'll wear their traditional outfits. I must admit that personally, I'm totally fascinated by these mountains, the Tian Shan Mountains. This is leading on one side to the Pamir Plateau and on the other side further into the Himalaya. So we are fairly high up on the mountains. And that brings our visit today to the end because what we'll do the next time we meet, we're gonna cross the border into China and travel around, along the Silk Road, visiting some sites that have to do with Chinese civilization, Buddhist and other religions, but it should culminate when we come to discover the Jewish story, the Jews of Kaifeng for a thousand years, there was this amazing Jewish community that managed to hold up until 19th century in a very special way. And then it was dwindling. And a minute before it was too late, they were discovered a few decades ago. But we'll visit with them and tell about them when we meet again next week. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. You might want to take a few minutes break. And if anybody has any questions or any comments, uh, I'm here to answer. Jacob, thank you so much. That was wonderful. I have to say every time I come out of one of your lectures, I feel like I just had an incredible history lecture. I, I wish I had uh, teachers like you in uh, high school and college. I feel like I would have come, I feel like I would have really learned a lot more than, than I ever did in any of my classes. Um, so side note, we, me and Adi always get a lecture before we actually come to this lecture. So I feel very blessed to have Jacob do a personal, um, a personal lecture for us before. So thank you, Jacob, for, for that, for the second time for a DNI. And thank you all of you for being here. Um, we are really excited to this being our, I wanna say our kickoff for fall and winter. And we're really excited to kick it off with Jacob. We really have an incredible lineup. Um, for October, um, starting with Jacob today and with his um, second tour. So please don't miss that next, um, next week on the 12th. Um, we did have some questions come in. So I'm gonna take the time to answer the questions uh, to, to ask you, I'm not gonna answer them, to ask you the questions that came in while, while you were um, speaking. Before we start, I want to say, because this came up a thousand times, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel. So please go to YouTube. It will be available within the next 48 hours. All you have to do is go to YouTube, search Baltimore Zionist District, um, and the, um, the uh, recording will appear. If you go to YouTube now and search, hit the little red subscribe button. And then once you subscribe, then you'll get a notification when any of our videos appear um, on there. So you don't have to keep searching for it. So now that that's out of the way, um, the first question is, if you could recommend one of these amazing places for a person to visit, which would you recommend? That could be a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very hard question. I cannot even begin to line them up by order, by importance or beauty. Yes. But uh, Turkey deserves a trip on its own. Uh, if you visit Armenia, you could do it in combination with Georgia and Uzbekistan and, Kuz and Kyrgyzstan should be done together. Azerbaijan could give you a full week on its own. And remember, I'm an Israeli. Let me remind you, we have now many daily flights connecting Israel with all these countries. So you might wanna consider on your next trip to Israel, maybe go for a few days to Azerbaijan or to Georgia or any of the other nations. We should only be healthy and travel and let this COVID-19 leave us alone or at least let us learn how to live with it so we can resume travel, right? Yes, yes, please. Um, okay, the name of the town in Uzbekistan where the Soviets took the Jews from Poland and used them for military labor. 
Samarkand, Samarkand, in other locations as well, but mostly Samarkand. That was a large concentration of Polish Jews. Great. Um, some of these people in the old Soviet areas of the South resemble Asian or Chinese people. Is that how most of the Silk Road, uh, is that how most are on the Silk Road? Absolutely, penetrating and infiltrating even into Turkey. When you walk around Turkey, you will see most of the population is Caucasian, but you will find many people with slightly slanted eyes and you know, flatter noses and high cheekbones, something that came along the Silk Road with the Turkic tribes. All of the Turkic tribes moved into this part of the world from somewhere in central Mongolia or somewhere, and that's how you are absolutely correct to observe these facial features, absolutely right. Okay, um, so someone mentioned that they heard that only Babylonian Jews are outside of Iraq were, uh, were are in Georgia. Do you know anything about that? So traditionally, the Jordan Jews believe that they moved there from Babylon. That's after the destruction of the first temple. Remember, the first temple was destroyed in 586 BCE and the Jews were taken by the Babylonians into the Babylonian diaspora. And a couple centuries later, they started traveling around. And that's how they ended up in Crimean Peninsula and other locations. And the Jordan Jews believe that they are originally from there. But the same could be said about the Jews in many of these countries that we have visited. Number one. Number two, we have the story of the Khazars. Sometime in the 10th or 11th century, there must have been some mass conversion of some local tribes into Judaism, which will explain the explosion all of a sudden of Jewish population in Ukraine, in um, different regions of that part of the world. But it's a sensitive theory we do not promote uh, because um, you have some people who say, oh, so. Uh, many of the Ashkenazi Jews are descended of the Khazars. What have they got to do with Israel? They should not go to Israel in that case, and so on and so on. But it is definitely a possibility, the Khazar Jews that moved into these regions. Um, many of the buildings have English titles on them. When were they added and why? Everything was added in the last 30 years in order to encourage tourism. Uh, in some countries, uh, like uh, even the country of Georgia, until a few years ago, everything was written up only in Russian and then they tolerated a little Georgian and now they've removed. You can barely find anything written in Russian. They are using uh, Latin characters. They are using English as the language to denote street signs and you know museums or all kinds of public buildings or what have you. But everything is the last 30 years all over these countries. Great. Um, is, uh, is safety an issue for women traveling alone for the places you went such as the Turkish Bazaar? Perfectly safe in all of these countries, perfectly safe. Turkmenistan, nobody goes anyhow. So we don't really have any reports. Uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned, it's the seventh least visited country in the world. Like hardly anybody sets foot there. But uh, in the, all the other countries, you are more than welcome. The only country if you go to, and you could, you know, it's a little complicated, but you could, and you should, if I may, go to Iran, then ladies out in public must cover their head with some kind of a, a, a scarf or something. But other than that, women are perfectly safe everywhere. My recommendation will be to arrange a tour before. If you don't join a tour group, at least in one for one day or half a day or whatever, when you get to a new town, you should get yourself a local guide to get orientation and get, you know, more specific and concrete directions and instructions on how to behave and where to go. 
but you are more than welcome to travel to all of these places. Great, yes, and a lot of people, it's a private chat, but I, a lot of people are saying that they've been to Turkey and other places and that was perfectly safe and safe place to go. But like you said, good to get a guide and a group of people to go with. Um, I visited some Samarkat, uh, but was not allowed to enter the Jewish cemetery as it was guarded. Apparently Jews in Israel pay for this. Is there a way of visiting? I'm so sorry you were not able to visit because we're, I don't know if you were on a tour group or you went on your own, but if you travel with the group, when I take groups over there, I make the arrangements and I have the gatekeeper open it for us because I'm fascinated walking in the cemetery, the different kind of tombs. Some of the comments written, some of the obituaries and the inscription breaks my heart. Here was this 19 years old and his tombstone say, uh, starved to death, starved to death. Breaks your heart, 19 years of age, but these of course were the years of the war. No, you should be able to visit it. It has to be arranged uh, in advance and definitely you can visit it. It's very, it's visited by everybody I know and I've been a few times and each time I went and I visited the cemetery. Great. Um, so who uh, runs tours? Obviously Jacob runs tours and when we send the information about the recording, we will send all of Jacob's information so that you can um, write to Jacob and ask him about his tours that he runs. Jacob, one last question that somebody has asked, the author of the Tehran Children. You mentioned. Uh... Don't or you remember can, you can it, get that to me. But we can see it on the presentation. Can... Let me run very quickly, see if I can find it while we speak. Great. Just link to the book. Oh, okay. Wait a minute. Someone sent me the link to the book. I can just pop it. You don't even need to look. Let me just okay. copy it right here. I will um let me come back to the the chat and do everyone in the meeting. Thank you, Mark. Mark R is my good friend here who looked it up for me. Here's the link to the Tehran children that a few people were asking for that will link you to Amazon right there. So I will leave the chat open for a few minutes so you can click on that. Um, and Jacob, I think that is it for the questions that I had copied while we were chatting and a few others. Um, uh, yeah, while we were chatting. So thank you again. I'm going to.